my great uh, pleasure to introduce Dermot Mannion. Uh, Dermot was, as I mentioned earlier on, our inaugural uh, speaker here at the Wings Club uh, European chapter six years ago. And at that time, of course, Dermot was the chief executive officer of our flag carrier, Aer Lingus. And I was asking Dermot at lunch what his uh, proudest achievement uh, for both him and his team, his leadership team, uh, many of which are represented around the room here today, uh, was back then. And of course, the, uh, the answer is pretty obvious. It was a hugely successful IPO of the airline in 2006, for which both the airline garnered a lot of capital and indeed the Irish ex exchequer did. Uh, since then, uh, Dermot was attracted out to Brunei to uh, be appointed as the executive director. Initially, he was appointed as a director of the board, but that didn't last too long with his old Dermot's talents. Uh, they made him an executive director and asked him to take the role of vice chairman and lead uh, what is what will be very obviously a very successful restructuring and uh, growth program of the airline. So we're very delighted, uh, Dermot, to welcome you. I'd like to ask you to join me here on the podium and uh, please give us the update of what you've been up to in the last six years. Ladies and gentlemen, Dermot Mannion. Good afternoon, everyone. After an introduction like that, I think I should sit down before I uh, damage my reputation, but uh, thank you very much indeed, John. It's lovely to be here. It's actually lovely to be anywhere these days in these uncertain times that we face in world aviation. Who can believe the uncertainty that has overtaken the world economy since the first time that I spoke here in 2007? And uh, isn't it wonderful that we're all still here? We're all still gainfully employed in the aviation world despite the many vicissitudes that we've seen over that period of time. John was kind enough to mention my career. I suppose I must be an Irishman who went in a somewhat circuitous route, as Irish people often do, starting off life in Emirates in London, then to Emirates in Dubai for many years. Spent uh, four very happy years, I have to say, as a, a representative of Emirates on the board of Sri Lankan Airlines. Back very proudly to lead Aer Lingus, as John said, uh, through the IPO program in 2005 and 2006, and now here I am in a dramatically different part of the world in Asia, where on the one hand, uh, the good news is that there is tremendous growth opportunity about the place, but on the other hand, there's tremendous competition for that growth, and we'll see and hear a little bit of that in this presentation today. We'll begin with just a few perspectives of what I've seen and heard around the Asian theater of operations in aviation, and then we'll get into a bit more specific comment to do with RBA and its uh, market positioning in all of that. Much of this is familiar territory. First of all, this is the Boeing forecast between 2010 and 2030. Asia Pacific, not unexpectedly, leading the way with average growth of about 7% a year. And if you look at the next slide, which is the equivalent Airbus material, their projections all the way to 2030, you can really see in very stark terms how Asia Pacific is moving into a dominant position. If compared to virtually steady state with Europe and North America now, just look at the way it powers ahead in the top section of the uh, chart here on both sides. Asia Pacific absolutely powering ahead in the years between now and 2030. So certainly no shortage of growth opportunities, at least according to the ma major manufacturers. Much talk about China. This is an interesting chart about China. These are the top five outbound tourism markets from China in the latest year for which we've got figures, which is 2011. What's particularly interesting about this tourism trend is much of it isn't tourism at all. The top two categories are special protection zones, which are already within China. So the evidence here would suggest that uh, China, in terms of outbound tourism, is very much a market that hasn't even entered into growth mode at this moment in time. The highest growing external market outside of the SARs is uh, Korea, uh, followed by Singapore uh, and Malaysia. But there's a lot more to come, and I think that's the basis of at least some of what you saw in the projections from the manufacturers in terms of where the industry is likely to go next in Asia. And indeed, Roy Brunei, for its own part, is very hopeful of taking its share in that growth in China tourism outside the country as it begins to develop and as it begins to unfold. In terms of the LCCs, 
This is the worldwide picture on LCCs, focusing on the top 25 uh, LCCs worldwide. This is growth measuring November 2011 versus 2010. A couple of very distinguishing features uh, notable here, uh, and I apologise, the chart is a little small, but just look at Indigo, in India growing by no less than 52% in that period. Indigo is a very good airline, well known to many of the leasing companies in this uh, room, but that's an extraordinary growth rate in a single 12-month period. In the next refinement of that slide, we focus it a bit more in red here on the LCCs that are more dominant in the Asian theatre of operations and certainly the airlines that are more of a competitive threat to RBA in our jurisdiction. And you can see the standout numbers here are AirAsia growing at about 10.5% and right down at the bottom another very good, very well managed airline which will be well known to the leasing community here, Cebu Pacific growing by almost 27%. They are worthy competitors on any route. So that's what's happening on short haul LCC, plenty of competition around. What's happening in Asia on long haul competition? This chart is looking at the traditional kangaroo route between uh, the United Kingdom and Australia uh, between the years 2003 and uh, 2011. And again, just look at that statistic, the Gulf carriers, not surprisingly, growing by a compound 20.3% a year in that period at a time when the European carriers are actually down by some 6.3%. It just shows you the shifting dynamics in the way that world aviation has moved uh, over recent years. And a chart of more specific interest now to Royal Brunei itself. This is measuring capacity on London, Australia, comparing Emirates, which is the top line in red, then Etihad in blue, Royal Brunei in black, and then right down at the bottom, uh, Qatar Airways in green. And you can see this is measuring the period 2004 to 2011. Uh, Emirates uh, doubled and then some. And just look at Etihad, the line in blue, from a steady start in 2006. Just look at that tremendous growth that they have seen in the period between 2006 to 2011. So again, the picture that we're seeing for a small a carriers as such as RBA, the theatre of operations on long haul, especially on the key kangaroo route, has become more aggressive and more competitive. And as if that wasn't enough, look what's happening on aircraft deliveries. This is a statistic from Peter Negline of BOC Aviation. He plots the number of aircraft delivered in the year 2013, or expected to be delivered in that year, I should say, versus 2010. There will be 91% increase in wide body deliveries in 2013 over 2010. So again, the message is going to be long haul competition is already tough, and it's going to get even tougher, especially in Asia Pacific. So where does all of this leave Royal Brunei Airlines in terms of its own market positioning? So let's move on to explore something of that. First of all, just the geography, Royal Brunei is, Brunei itself is located on the island of Borneo, which you see uh, featured here, the immediate countries in our vicinity, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Philippines, and Indonesia. That is the theater of operations in which RBA operates. The country itself, um, very high GDP, ranked uh, fifth in the world by GDP per capita. Much of that uh, driven by uh, oil and gas developments in recent years, but a limited population, just 400,000 people in Brunei, approximately the population of Cork. Difficult to mount a serious international challenge in terms of long haul operations, especially from a city of that size, although Speaking to some of the Cork people around the room, they'd say, if you can do it in Brunei, we could do it in Cork as well. So you never know. You never know. But it's a challenge, for sure. Brunei is itself a gateway to the rainforest of Borneo. Uh, it is, has tremendous potential for tourism, especially for ecotourism, which is an area that is beginning to be developed and progress now 
in Brunei in this period of time. And indeed, the next picture shows you my dear self getting involved in ecotourism right here. This is me standing on top of the canopy walk where you climb 800 feet early morning. The idea is you're right in the heart of the rainforest. You climb before dawn to be on top at the point that I'm at now, which is 800 feet above. And you can look right out when the sun comes up over the pristine rainforest that hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's a very unique experience and something that I would recommend to anyone uh, in the room. So tremendous potential for the development of uh, tourism in Brunei. In terms of more serious regional competition issues, this is the same regional map, but we've now plotted the airline competition that we see in our theater of operations, and you can see just how competitive the region has become. In addition to the traditional flag carriers, people like SQ and uh, Malaysian, we've now, of course, got Air Asia, and more recently, Air Asia X, operating in our theater of operations. In uh, Jakarta, of course, not only is there competition from Garuda, but now we've got Lion Air. What a name they're about to become in this industry over the next period of time. They are an airline that we're going to be hearing a lot more about in our region and probably in just about everyone else's region over the next uh, period of time. So what's emerging is a very competitive long-haul marketplace, as we've seen in plotting the kangaroo traffic movements. And the same story very much applies on regional traffic movements as well around the Asia-Pacific Rim. What kind of airline is RBA then? Well, this will give you a flavor of what we were in the year 2000. Uh, an extensive regional network, as you would expect, around our Asia-Pacific Rim. But in addition, what was then a very extensive range of long-haul services operating to all kinds of places in Europe, such as uh, Frankfurt, extensive range across the Middle East with Jeddah, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, and then getting nearer to home into Bangkok. Down into Australia, three routes, Perth, Darwin and uh, Brisbane. So a very extensive network in the year 2000, but what's happened since? By 2010, uh, scaled back uh, somewhat, much of the European operation gone except for London, as you can see there. The Middle East scaled right back to Dubai and Jeddah uh, on a seasonal basis, and the other routes which are shown to Australia here, uh, Perth, Brisbane and Auckland. Unfortunately, the difficult task that I faced when I got there in late 2010 was there was no justification to continue those three routes as they currently stood into Australia and New Zealand, and we had to cancel them. A very painful decision in a very small market and in an economy that was heavily dependent on air travel, but an important decision nonetheless. Given the trend that you've seen on kangaroo traffic, there was simply no place for RBA in that marketplace spreading itself as thinly as we had spread ourselves right across Australia and New Zealand. So in very simple terms, what we've ended up with now is a very simple long haul network that only includes the strategically important destinations of London, Dubai on one side, Melbourne, Australia is our chosen destination there, which will be serving daily from the end of this month. So those are the strategically important long haul routes for the future for RBA. The rest is very much focused on concentrating on our regional theatre of operations here, developing traffic to Brunei, but also our sister city of Kota Kinabalu, which is in the neighbouring state of Sabah on the island of uh, Borneo. That is the fastest growing tourism destination in Southeast Asia. It's also the fastest growing airport in Southeast Asia. RBA is the biggest operator to that airport, and we are planning to see a significant expansion of our operations there uh, over a period of time. So given the small size of the Brunei market, we have identified Kota Kinabalu here as being a very important strategic opportunity for us to grow. And I'm pleased to say that the government of the state of Sabah awarded Roy Brunei Airlines the award of Airline of the Year for its services in 2011. And that's a market that we're very keen to develop in these circumstances. All of that, of course, led to the corporate restructuring of the organization that I think John referred to at the start. Uh, very difficult uh, in a small community where 
RBA is the third biggest employer in the community after the government and after Brunei Shell. So a difficult implementation, but a necessary one nonetheless. The first thing we did was rationalised the long haul route network, as you've seen uh, in the previous chart, and that's already successfully implemented uh, as we speak. A corporate rebranding and repositioning of the organization is also underway, and we'll have uh, some further thoughts about that in one of the subsequent uh, slides. Staff right sizing, again, a very difficult challenge. Over 2,000 people employed in RBA when I joined in November 2010. Uh, that number has reduced by 500 now. A very, very difficult process, and I'd like to pay tribute to the work of Victor Grove and Private Air, who worked with us on an operations audit and also worked with us on a customer service audit in that period to make sure that we could work our way through the downsizing period without affecting customer service and in fact with the challenge to improve customer service as we're downsizing the organization. That was a very successful project and a sincere thanks to Victor and his team for the excellent work which they did with us on that. Fleet rationalization is something we'll come on to in a moment. You'll see where we've got to, especially on long haul, where we had some fairly complex fleet issues that had to be resolved. And I'm glad to say that most of that has now been satisfactorily put to bed. We'll see the shape of the fleet uh, in a moment. Cost reduction and stabilized cash flow. Well, as a derivative of all of the above, the primary objective was to dramatically improve cash flow in the organization, which we have done substantially reduces losses in the organization which we have done and improve the overall cost profile and make us more cost efficient especially for competing on regional services with the out and out LCCs. The customer service experience has also been improved and as part of the work that we did with Victor and his team at the same time as we were downsizing we were upskilling the staff that remained to make sure that customer service has actually improved as a result of the process and I'm pleased to say that um, indications from various customer surveys so far are that the outcome of that has been very, very positive indeed and we're well on the road to recovery. All designed to produce a better future and a better Royal Brunei Airlines. Let's talk about fleet. Short haul, it's very simple. We've got a small short haul fleet soon to grow to five units, all leased from our colleagues at CIT and we thank Jeff and his, his colleagues on the team for their support in, in, in recent months and in recent years indeed in getting to where we are now. Based on what I've said in this presentation and our aspirations to grow, especially services through Kota Kinabalu, that is a short haul fleet that we are targeting to grow, grow in the next period of time. Long haul was a bit more complicated. When I arrived, we had a contract with Boeing for four 777-300 ERs designed to take us all the way non-stop between uh, Brunei and London. Unfortunately, that didn't really meet the test of the fleet rationalization, so the first thing we had to do was cancel that order and put them aside. Also, when I got to Brunei, uh, the fleet at that moment comprised of uh, six 767 300ER aircraft, aging, uh, expensive, both from a maintenance and fuel burn point of view, so again, one of the first challenges there was to retire those aircraft from the fleet, which we've now done uh, successfully. On an interim basis, we replaced the long haul capacity with six 777-200ERs, which we took on short term lease from uh, Singapore Airlines. That is the uh, capacity that we're using currently uh, on long haul. But all of this is designed to prepare us for the entry into service of the 787-800 Dreamliner, which I'm delighted to say that RBA is one of the launch customers for, albeit, of course, much delayed. Those aircraft were first promised, as you know, in 2009. We are tentatively scheduled for our first aircraft in August 2013, and indeed, when I leave Dublin tomorrow, I'm en route to Seattle to make sure that we begin to get those aircraft when the delivery stream is supposed to start in August of next year. We're placing a lot of hope, a lot of reliance in the Dreamliner and the efficiency that that will bring to the fleet in terms of uh, adding further benefit to the bottom line and uh, turning a loss-making situation into a profit. So much rationalization there uh, on the long-haul fleet, and I'm delighted to say it's all satisfactorily completed now 
and we're set fair for the future, especially with the entry into service of the Dreamliner next year. Then just a couple of final thoughts uh, on the future and where we go next at, uh, at RBA. First of all, I mentioned rebranding, which is uh, an interesting topic uh, all of its own. Rebranding really implies repositioning, which is what we're talking about in this chart. What it measures really is from the extreme, if you like, of the LCC operators here on the left to the top premium airlines on the right. The challenge for RBA is where do we fit into all of that, especially as an airline that carries a relatively modest 1.5 million uh, passengers a year? What we've decided is the positioning should really be somewhere here, which is between full service and what we call regional, setting ourselves up really as a true boutique airline status with the definition of a stylish small airline situated in an interesting and attractive location. That is the dictionary definition of boutique and we think that applies very well indeed to RBA. So much of the work that we've been doing in recent times with Private Air and, and others indeed has been about repositioning the airline in that space and the corporate rebranding program which is going on at the moment will be designed to actually put that out into the marketplace and to kind of bring that selling proposition to the attention of our customers in all of the markets that we serve. <clears throat> so that new rebranding process is underway now and will be further rolled out in the next uh, 6 to 12 months. Finally then, the way forward in terms of the future. At a macro level, the overall macro picture for Brunei is very strong, as you've seen. The oil and gas business is uh, very healthy and there's a solid base for us on which to develop. GDP per head is already high and growing. Again, this gives us a catalyst for growth. The challenge, of course, is the population is small at 400,000, so we have to be measured and we have to be extremely careful in what we're doing, and that's exactly what we, what we are doing, and indeed is very much our approach, especially to right-sizing the long-haul uh, aspect of our business. Competition on long-haul is intense and growing. You've seen that. It's self-evident, I think, from what I've said and what you've seen in the slides today. Restructuring the organization is all about putting us in a better place to compete with the out-and-out -out LCCs on short haul, and already the evidence, I think, is very positive in that respect. The kind of customer service that RBA stands for, the sort of ethos that's associated with the airline, is already been very well received, especially in the Asian markets that we serve, and we're very confident that with the new rebranded RBA, no matter what, the LCCs throw at us on the one side and the full service long haul on the other, we will be able to retain our position in that marketplace. So overall then, our focus is very much to stay regionally focused on our short haul operations with a small number of strategically important long haul destinations and where we can use the regional network to feed long haul uh, as the needs and as the plans uh, dictate. So there we are. That's a very quick summary of a very interesting 18 months or so that I've now been associated with this project in Brunei. A lot has been achieved. I'm very proud of the work that's been done uh, so far, but there's still some way to go. But overall, I think we can confidently say that Royal Brunei Airlines today is much better placed to face what is going to be for every airline in every jurisdiction a much more competitive environment in the next couple of years than anything that any of us have seen anywhere else in the world over recent years. So, Mr. President, thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen.